Thank you again for being here for worship. Excited that we're able to do this. Uh, and if you will now, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this beautiful day you've provided us with, Father. We are thankful for your many gracious things that you provide for us each and every day that we take for granted. Father, we just pray that we don't take these for granted and we see you and everything around us. Father, we are so mindful of all these on our prayer list, especially those that are suffering this morning. Father, we just lift up for the gym and Sister Lisa doing their immediate struggles, Father. Remember all these on our prayer list, those that are taking cancer treatments and those that are sick and shut in and just suffering daily. Father, we ask a special blessing for those that are tending to their loved ones, that you would strengthen them and comfort them, knowing that you are in total control of each and every situation. Father, we thank you for this great country we live in, for our leaders of this country, Father, we just pray that you would bless them and that they would lead this country in a way that is that we can continue to have our freedoms together together to worship you and this country can be brought back to a nation that would be pleasing unto you. Father, we mindful of our military and their service and ask that you be with them and their families. Father, we thank you for the, the Christians that meet here at Christian Chapel. Father, we ask a special blessing upon those that are able to get out and especially those that are not able to get out for fear of this virus. Pray that you be with Brother Derek this morning as he brings a lesson and that we'll take what he has printed to us and look into thy word and apply it to every day walks of life to help us to be stronger and better Christians that you would have us to be. Continue to be with us to stay as we worship you and sing songs and praise you and remember your son and his willingness to die on that cross that we could have beginning for forgiveness of our sins and the hope of eternity in heaven one day with you. In your son's precious name we pray. Amen. Now, if you just saw what I saw with Brian walking in with that mask, that's creepy. <laughs> that is creepy. So let me, uh, let me let me start off by asking this. What would you say to God if you were being accused of something that you know you didn't do? Well, what would you say to God at, at that point? Let me ask you this. What would you say to God if you were being pursued by someone who was wanting to kill you? If you were being hunted? Every time you woke up, that you had to look behind your shoulder because somebody was wanting to kill you. What would you say to God? Let me ask you, what would you say to God if you had the Job effect take place? You know, the three F's? If, if your farm was taken uh, from you, if your friends uh, abandoned you and were taken away from you, and your family was literally physically taken away from you. What would you say to God at that point? What would you say to him if, if, if your kids were, were, were killed, if your family is destroyed, if your farmland, your money you have is taken away from you and your friends abandon you? What would you do if you knew that somebody was pursuing you every day to kill you? And what would you do if you were being accused of doing something that you know you didn't do? What would you say to God? What we normally find is that people begin to ask the question, why? Sometimes people take it a little bit uh, uh, to another one and saying, is there even a God? They begin to question, why are these things taking place? And God, I need some answers. And so what I find intriguing is Psalms 26. So if you will, I want us to read there because this is a, a passage of where we literally see David asking a question, really. So let, let's read this to begin. Verse 1, Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. 
Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. I do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around the altar, O Lord, proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Do not sweep my soul away with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men, in whose hands are evil devices and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I shall walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground, and in the great assembly I will bless the Lord. I am sure many of us have seen the movie Hunger Games. Or maybe I saw, I remember the first time on, on TNT, I saw a, a movie called Surviving the Game. And it's where these men have taken this homeless man, took him out to a cabin in the middle of the woods, and, and said, all right, you've got 30 minutes head start, and we're coming to hunt you. Woo. Now, that's TV. Reality is, that is what David is dealing with. Reality is, he has Saul on a daily basis coming to kill him. And what we see is David's approach to God saying this, I want you to examine me because I do not deserve the pursuit of Saul. Now, this is different. Because if you were to look at Psalms 25, you see that this is a prayer of David asking for forgiveness. Why would David need to ask for forgiveness? Well, as we know, David has covered two things. He has taken something, he has taken something that doesn't belong to him. He took a woman, Bathsheba, that wasn't his, and he took somebody's life, Uriah, that wasn't his to take. And so in Psalms 25, you see there in verse 7, you know, remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions according to your steadfast love. Remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. You look at verse 11. Uh, for your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. And so you have in Psalms 25, him approaching God saying, listen, I need forgiveness. Forgive me of the sins that I have. But then you look at Psalms chapter 26, and it almost comes across... As if David is a little bit arrogant. Because he says, I want you to view, to examine my integrity. I want to put my life on the block for you to look. Because I can guarantee you what you're going to find is something that is pure and right. And I don't deserve to have to wake up every morning, look over my shoulder, and see Saul coming after me. Would you want your life to be examined? You know, as most of you know, I absolutely love to cook, and I love to eat, and I love to watch people cook. But I'm fascinated when chefs are able to make a plate and say, this is what it's supposed to take to taste like. I was telling the other group, I. I can cook for my family all day. And to be honest with you, it really doesn't matter to me if they like it or not. <laughs> but it's hard when you have to cook for other people. Because then when they taste it, and it's like, and you're like, well, how was it? Oh, yeah, that's good. Oh, yeah, okay. You know. But when you have somebody who's willing to take the plate and say, all right, dear, this is the way it's supposed to taste. Now taste. They're so confident in the fact that they have been doing this for so long and that they've been following these instructions, these ingredients for so long and have cooked it for so long they can say, this is what it's supposed to taste like and it's good. 
I want you to examine everything that's on this plate and tell me if you think there's something that's wrong with it. All right, can you cook something where you're that confident in being able to say, hey, I need you to, look, examine every bit of this. David is being literally hunted down and he asks God this, examine my life. Because I don't think I deserve what's going on in my life. And so what David does is he, he supplies for us the reason why he should not be pursued. By taking his, inter his integrity, his character, and putting it in front of the Creator and said, here you go, look at it. Integrity is not perfection. Integrity is not living your life without any sin whatsoever. Matter of fact, I have one of the things that I liked was integrity is righteousness in consistency. You know why McDonald's is so good? And don't even try to debate it. Like, don't say, oh, McDonald's is not good. Yes, it is. A French fry from McDonald's is always good. A second after it comes out of the grease, and a year later. <laughs> it is absolutely amazing. You know why they're so good? It's consistent. I know that when I ask him, what do you want for lunch today? It's just being him. Guess what he said? A 20 piece chicken egg meal. He says he wants to own a McDonald's. You want to know why? Because he wants to be able to go and get him a 40 piece whenever he wants. <laughs> Why is it? Because he knows that when he bites down into that chicken nugget, it's going to always taste like that chicken nugget. But every time I want to order a Big Mac or, or a Met chicken, it's going to always taste like that. It's consistent. Your integrity is something, when you look at it spiritually, it's day by day in accordance to God's will. It is being consistent. 1 Kings chapter 9, Solomon, uh, David's son, God approaches, God speaks to Solomon and says, listen, live your life. Walk in the way of your father, David, with integrity. He actually says this, he goes, when God uh, speaks to David's son, Solomon, and Kings, and he says this, if you will walk before me as David thy father walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness. This was even after the fact that David had coveted two things. This is after that David had committed some horrible sin. But it's not a life of perfection. It is a life of consistency, of day in and day out. I want to live for you, God, in accordance to his will. And so with confidence, not with arrogance, David looks at God, approaches God, and says this, examine my integrity. Examine my life. Because I just don't feel like this is supposed to happen. And so this is what we see in this. The first thing when you look at David's integrity, you see it in verses 4 and 5. He says, I refuse to sit with the wicked. This is really also an examination for us. He refuses to sit with the wickedness. He says, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I don't sit with men of falsehood. I don't want to be around people that doesn't tell uh, the truth. I don't want to sit with people who lie. He goes, listen, I hate the assembly of evildoers. And I will not sit with the wicked. So he says, listen, yeah, examine me. I mean, from head to toe, I want you to look at me. Because, well, let me tell you this. God, I don't like to sit with wicked. Here's the second thing he does. He says, I absolutely love worship. He, he goes back to the priest and he says, listen, I cleanse my hands before I come in. I'm innocent before you. I love to walk around and to be in your presence. 
You know, I sometimes wonder how many of us just kind of dread doing this. Oh. Well, I got to do it, though. I got to do it. I just got to make sure that, you know, got to make sure I walk in just to make sure everything is covered. I got to, David says, listen, I love it. But I want you to think about, though, what has happened to David. David has sinned, and he is being pursued. He's being hunted. And with all the things that have taken place in David's life, his son has been taken away from him. We don't need to forget that. David's youngest son is taken away from him, is killed. And he says, I love to come and worship you, God. So I place my integrity on the block, and I want you to look and see this, because I don't like sitting around and being with wickedness, and I absolutely love being around you. And the last thing he does, as far as just kind of supplying the reason why he shouldn't be pursued here, he, he, he's basically a weatherman. You see this in verse 11 and 12. He gives the forecast to his future. Basically, he, he, he deals with it like this. Even if I'm continued being pursued by Saul, even if nothing else changes whatsoever, my, my feet are still stable. And he ends this prayer the same way he began this prayer. He said, and I will still walk in my integrity. Even if nothing changes, I can go ahead and tell you what my life is going to be like next year or tomorrow. I'm still going to be consistent. I'm still going to day in and day out live for you. Every day I'm going to still want to worship you because I love it. Day in and day out, he's still going to just try his best to stay away from sin. Even with the understanding that he will see it. But he's being consistent in walking in the will of God. So this morning, I, I just, when, when I think about this text in Psalms 26, there's so much that I can ask you here, but I really just want to ask this, this one. Would you put your life on the block? For your innocence, would you say, God, I want you to examine my life? Because I'm here to tell you, I'm living for you, God. Would you be willing to do that? We're told all the time to look in the mirror, right? Look in the mirror, examine yourself, and just say, hey, what are some changes I need to make? Are you willing to go to the step that David did? And go to God, listen, look at my life, examine me. Because I don't think I'm, I really deserve what's happening. But even if it happens, I'm still going to live in my integrity. Are you able to ask God to examine my life? This morning, if we can in any way, whether it be a child of God, or be resurrected in, in, in baptism to start a new life, or if you've done that and you've just fallen away, your integrity has been crushed, it's time to get it back on the right track. If we can have you come right now while we stand and sing. All things are ready, come to the feast. Come for the table now is spread. Ye famishing, ye weary, come, and thou shalt be richly fed.
Chapter 6, verses 47 through 51. 47 through 51. Truly, truly, I say, say to you, whosoever believeth has eternal life, and the bread of life. Your father ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity you've given us to come here this morning to study another portion of our word. We thank you for this opportunity we have that we can come together and bring praises to your name. We thank you for your son and his willingness to come here and walk on this earth so we all can have hope of eternal life in you one day. We thank you for this loaf, which by faith represents it, that flesh that we were just talking about. We ask that you be with each one of us that we take of this flesh, of this loaf, to remind of the flesh, uh, of Christ's flesh and what suffering it went through so we all can have forgiveness of sin. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. You bow with me again. Again, Heavenly Father, we come before thee thanking you for your Son. We thank you for this cup, which by faith represents his blood. Again, we ask that we, if we partake of this cup, we take our minds back to the cross, remember the blood that was shed on the cross for each and every one of us. So I pray in Christ's name. I invite you to stand as we sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of this song, which uh, Caleb will dismiss us in prayer. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame God.
continue to bless them with swift healing. Lord, help us to be like you in everything that we do. As the kids are starting school, bless them and the teachers and administrators. Lord, with good health and how to handle the situation that is before. God, we love you so much. In your son's name we pray. Amen.